so um, our guest tonight is the Sibu Mabena, who we've all come here to see and listen to. So Sibu Mabena is the founder of Juma Collective, which is a creative communications agency which services mainly FMCG brands. Um, they do event productions, they manage performing artists, and they deal with government departments as well in the country and across the, the rest of the continent. Uh, well, that's just um, yeah, the main outlook of what they do, but obviously we should just elaborate further on what, everything else that they do. And um, so she began to begin the business uh, formally as a way, as she says, that she could invoice professionally. Because before that, she was a dancer and choreographer, dealing with um, one of, some of the biggest names that we have in the country uh, in terms of performing artists. So she then did that, opened a business, and it literally, it went from, well, she got supported and then was a operations manager, if I'm not wrong, of uh, one of the big social agencies in the country, which she then grew for the company from. Uh, one million to a ten million grossing company within the space of six months. And then she went even further and then she grew her own business from just 90,000 seed capital which she gained while doing her BA in political science at GP. And a year later she was grossing around one million per annum in her business. So this is, this is the lady who sort of knows what she's doing. And that's part of the reason why we we'll be having her on it. I would like everybody here to give her the warm, warm welcome. If you can stand, rise, go, go crazy, and this is my man. Come through! Yo. Okay, I had enough of it in me. 
So I was put into a competitive team, which competed with South African dance team. So we were basically the Olympic team of hip hop dancing. No one knew we existed, but we did. And I think that's what exposed me to the big uh, world of entertainment. So my first competition was in Germany. I was 10, I was 11, but it was the year 2002. And just seeing how big things are outside of South Africa opened my eyes a lot. And I think I just wanted more with everything that we did back home at 11 years old. So my parents paid for my first trip back overseas, and every year after that, I stayed up on my own. So I've been a hustler since I was 11, just so I could afford to go overseas with my friends to go and compete to represent the country because the government wasn't paying us to go. So I made a plan, I wrote letters, I sold fudge, I washed cars, I babysat, I worked in aftercares during the holidays. I taught other kids how to dance. At the end, I was teaching great, like six year olds, sorry. Um, but yeah, the hustling nature, if you want to give it yourself, was basically what my mother said, and I did it. So you say that comes from your mother primarily? Also because she just didn't have a lot of money to go around. So it, she tried her best the first year, she said, ah, you've already been there, so why don't you go again? Because I wanted more and more and more and more. I figured if you do it myself, and no one's going to tell me anything. That's quite aggressive. Because, you know, a lot of people, we, people get challenges, like most financial challenges, they're like, ah, but I can't. So I, I'd like us to go a bit deeper into that, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on as we go along, because I think that, that mindset is, is, is one that a lot of people have inherited, but somehow there's barriers. So that's what I want to unpack as to, do you think is, is, is it something that it's just taught, you see it, and then, okay, I see my mother has it like this, my sister has it like this, I can do it as well, you know what I mean? But, take us back, now you in, you in primary, you're hustling, and, 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 and the repertoires, how, how, how did they come into the, into the, into the So, with the Rips, which are a dance crew um, that was based in Joburg, there was a time when dancing was really big, hip hop dance, uh, because of movies like You Got Served and you know, the rappers were using dances, Missy Elliott was a thing. So dance became a huge phenomenon, and we were on the more formal side of dancing. I moved to my dad um, in Sunny Hill. I moved to live with him, I think this was 2007 or something, 2008. And I had some friends that, uh, what we had done, we had done So You Thinking of Dance. We were called into like dance with each other. And through that, we were exposed to now, okay, the joke of dancing, because we need little kids from Victoria Studios and do white people dancing, that's what they call it. <laughs> and um, we saw what was happening, or I saw what was happening with other crews, and somehow um, got involved with Strictly Hip Hop, which is a dance competition in Victoria. And we competed in that. After Strictly Hip Hop, I asked the organizer if I could work for the competition because I just liked what was happening and people being in control. And like, yeah, this one's taking this one, what to do? I want to be that person also. I don't want to get told what to do, I want to tell people what to do. So um, I worked for Strictly Hip Hop and then I saw the equivalent of the competition in Joburg. So I approached the guy in Joburg, his name is Simba. He runs an organization called Clinch. And I got into working with Clinch and I was seeing what's happening on the streets in the reps. The reps had an audition. And I figured, let me just go try myself out. And there were some dance styles that I learned in Victoria, because there's an international that we had put in, because we come from the side of things that has a little bit more money than the street. So this Kamari lady, Kamari's from the States, she taught a style called whacking. So I went in there, French whacking, the guys hadn't seen it before, so they were like, yeah, you're the plug, come through. So I ended up being a part of the crew as that girl that does the other dancing that other people can't do. And through that, working behind the scenes of the competitions and knowing a couple of people and getting to know artists and, and I just became a good person to have in the room. So that's what happened. I lasted eight months with the ribs and then I was in the trick and I had to just focus and take my life seriously. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, what I seem to get, it's my failing my life. What I seem to get from your 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 history is is someone who, if you like something and you, you sort of take it, you you wanted to be involved. You wanted to. I mean, not everyone who likes 
I mean, you like that effect, that sorry. And then you approach the person who works with them, just wanted to, you didn't even, you weren't looking for a job or anything. You, were, you just wanted to, what, 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 what is that? Why, why, why did you do things like that? And do you think that has anything to do with where you are right now? That, you know, sometimes people say, hey, this person is like, yo, you know what I mean? So, share with us a bit. I think I work in Papa. Things who were born on the bed and be seen and they will always be in the room. So with Buses and Rhythm, for example, I went to December and there were no jobs. There was, they didn't need anything. But I said, who's going to be answering your phone whilst you're busy judging on stage? And he was like, um, my phone will be off. I said, but your phone can't be off because you're the organizer. I'm 17 at that time. And I was just like, no, just bring your phone, I'll hold your phone, I'll answer. And then the phone rang as I was holding it. Then I answered and I said, so Mr. Oliver, how can I help you? And he was like, okay, fine, it works. You're hired. <laughs> and I didn't want to work, I worked for free. Yeah. But the turning point in, in with the Masters of Rhythm story was someone called with the issue with the after party. And I solved it without telling Simba. And then only after we had solved it, I was like, oh yeah, by the way, this happened, this happened, the other, and this club fixed it. And he was like, okay, cool, next year, you're hired, you're definitely working with us. And from there, I met someone called Jake Hayabe. Jake Hayabe has been super pivotal, or he's, he's, he's been at the center of a lot of the work I've done in dancing, and also my introduction into the brand space. So my first big gig was with Flying Fish, sorry, Fish Eagle, uh, where we managed a dance competition for them um, at Street Cred. And there were issues there, so he's like, no, I'm gonna make it up to you, so let's work on the next gig, and that was the Miller, so they wanted to convert their promoters into dancers and make it cool and make it with a hip hop brand. And I did the choreography for that. I was actually a dancer in this thing and we made it really cool and people loved it. So we what got was this was in 2008, 2009. So I was on the trip. And then in my first year, yeah, first year we did the Miller thing. So that was 2010. I also did McDonald's. Um, we were cheerleaders for me like what we for the FIFA World Cup, so we danced at 12 games. We first started with the AFCON, and that was free. We didn't get paid. We were going to rehearsal every Saturday and Sunday, nine hours a day, and working with Moshe Kupa. So because it was Moshe Kupa, I was just like, I would need it. And now I'm attending AFCON games for free and what, dancing on the pitch. What do you say to someone who sees that opportunity and is like, okay, I know it's Moshe Kupa, but like, I'm not getting paid. Like, you know, I mean, yeah. really, really, I had to get the taxis and, you know, and this was before Uber, so it was, you know, this is, this is, this is the mission. Why do you say to that person who's, who would have learned something just by being there, yes. but passed it up? I worked on other things so that I could afford to do this free thing. When I say I was babysitting, I was doing it all through my high school life. When I was teaching kids, I was coaching dance kids, for example. Um, for the SA team that I used to be a part of. I used to charge them 10 rand an hour, but I was charging 24 kids 10 rand an hour, and we were rehearsing for three hours a day. Numbers ever? When, yeah, when my first envelope came in, I was like, whoa, like this is a cat, like, this is a lot of money. And that was what was funding me doing my passion project. So I'll touch on having multiple streams of income so you can find what you want to do um, with what you have to do. So, um, the McDonald's thing wasn't paying, yes, but it wasn't, it was it was more beneficial to me than it was detrimental. Because instead of getting my hair done in weaves at the time, or you know, really like great hairstyles, I was paying for taxis to go from Centurion to Craigle, and then Craigle back to Centurion. And that, the exposure to Nosha Cooper and Nosha Cooper's style of teaching and style of working, I've carried throughout my life with the discipline that she taught. She's a really, she's incredible in terms of the psychology she applies to what she does that you can't buy. So it doesn't, for me at least, it doesn't matter that it costs me to do a job, but the glory and the experience that I can't buy with physical money is worth much more than what I spend. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I think, what, what do you think when, I'm trying to, I'm trying to touch with something which, I personally believe in, but I just want to take, get your take on. Do you think doing things like that has a sort of, for lack of a better word, a 
cosmic return? 100% because um, every action has a reaction. I owe a lot of my so-called success today to all the things that I did. So me dancing for free for the McDonald's cheerleaders, um, and to me being at stadiums 12 times, which led to me meeting 16 other dancers, which some of them still dance with me today. For example, I live the summer's rehearsal now. One of the girls that I was dancing with four years ago is dancing for the summers and I'm able to create employment and revenue for her. Um, because of the relationships that we established then, I can call Losha Kukwa today and say, Losha, I only have a 20,000 year budget, I'm sorry, but I really need you on this project. And because she remembers me from working tirelessly four years ago, she'll be able to do it because of the relationships that we established. So every action has a reaction. That's beautiful. So, okay, you do the McDonald's here. Uh, <laughs> um, I, want us, I want us now to slowly move into to Duma Collective. But obviously, Duma Collective is a, how can I say, it's a kind of niche, the offspring. Because before Duma Collective, there was the Duma Communications, right? Take us through. So through all this fun stuff that I'm doing with all the dancing and Villa and Villa becomes brutal fruit, brutal fruit becomes flying fish and now we're running around just like the, come the streets of the SAB offices and getting to meet really cool influential people who manage the brands there. And one of those um, key people was Jean Dimitri and Jean moved to MTV Base. So when John moved to MTV, he became the marketing manager there and he had seen me doing a whole bunch of other things. By the way, somewhere in between there, I worked at the Sands as a bartender. Yes, yes. <laughs> there was that Sands episode and I kept seeing me. The Sands. Why do I have the Sands? Come to the Sands. I'm like, what is the Sands thing, you know? So somewhere in Sands and then was it the uh, a woman's dance thing that she did there as well? Something yeah. like that. And I take a story back. You've been busy, Joe. So the Sands friends were always going to the sands and I'd go with them and they were DJs there and I was just like it actually doesn't make sense every weekend I'm here in Yakuva and if you guys are getting paid and I'm not getting paid and what are we doing? So got familiar with the owner, um, Alan, and I said to him one time, yo, can I just work behind the bar? I'm cute, I'll make you a lot of money. And he said, okay, cool. And um, through that I was able to meet a number of people and again back to Jean Dimitri. He was at MTV and he needed to do an activation for Clip Drift. And he wanted a really like cool way to make sure people know that this thing is happening and fill up the just, like fill up the space and make noise about it. So say cool. He called me up and he was like, listen, I know you're dancing, but I also see you doing social media. Can you organize your tour ads to just you know talk about this thing, blah blah blah? So I was like, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, but now I'm like, yo, how am I gonna invoice an entire MTV? I can't be a few like I can't, like they can't just you know, so I registered a company in 2014, and the name, I was just, I couldn't figure out a cool name that was not catchy enough, so I was just like, oh, no one's going to take this name, so I'll just go do it now because that's, it's time to a song, and, you know, I just kind of... That's 10 names for viewers watching maybe on the thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm with Doma Communications, I registered that, and I moved into an office with pop bottles. So pop bottles, um, again, because there was an event I used to go to a lot, I was like, oh, dude, show me there's a way I can work here, like, what's this rhythm, like, shrinking a pop, like, anything else I've done. And um, he introduced me to Lance, who's his business partner. I said, Lance, look, I'm involved in eventing, I know a lot of people, I can just be your PA. He's like, no, we don't have to be your PA, but you look like someone who can do some things. And I said, cool, it's the trade exchange. I will come to you and work in your office, and you give me office space in exchange for revenue. So it's going pay me. 15k, 10, and then the five is my rent. Cool. So we did that. My company's registered. I've got a lease agreement with Green Star. Um, I've got an office now. And just quickly, Ryan. I, I think, I think, just in case we missed it, this is the guy that's in charge of pop-up Yeah. So you go in. Mm -hmm. What? 
what's your proposition then? Why I'm dreaming of dimples is yeah. because he was playing at the sands all the time. So they did pop on at the sands one time and I'm part of I'd come to work early just so I could see set up and talk to people and help them and offer a like, helping hand and now instead of just being the bartender, I'm also assisting with the guest list or I'm assisting with the promoters or I'm assisting with set up. Now Lance is familiar with me too, he says, hey Lance, he wants to work on pop bottles, um, do we have a job for him? And I say, yeah, I can be a PA. He says, no, we don't have time for a PA, but you look like someone who work because we work at the set. Great. That's how I get the office and my proposition is, I want 15k, you have it, but pay me in office space and cash. And he had an office. But what was happening at the time was Pierre and Nate were also renting an office from this big office. So now I've got to pay names as a contact who are very close to me today because we used to see each other every other day. Now I'm helping them, hey guys, what are you doing? Do you need help? <laughs> so I just always offered my services and for a lot of the time it wasn't for money, but it was in exchange for relationships and the relationships I couldn't establish with them from being a varsity with them. If you look at spay and names, you find it milkshake, pimples, all of them know each other from UJ, University of DJs, or Viz. And then you look at a lot of brand managers, people that work at SAP, people that work at Heineken, people that work, yeah, they all went to schools together. So they've got those circles that I could never be a part of because of one, I went to tux, two, I'm not their age, three, I'm not related to them, but how do I infiltrate these circles? Four, you have dating in your Yes. <laughs> um, and I infiltrate the circles by offering my help so they can see my skills, and one day they would want to pay for them. That's exactly what happened. And do my communications happen? Um, take us through some of the big, um, big projects you had with Ubuntu my concert and how you managed. Because this is still you're still a one-man show at the time, right? Mm -hmm. So someone actually said, "When I see you're such a high level, you're actually running a high level freelancing operation because there's a lot of freelancers out there." Um, no, I've got a company now. And they were like, yeah, okay, fine, you've got a company, but it's you. And also, they couldn't say this book with my name. I was just like, oh, I'm going to do my money. You a joke out of it. I mean, I'm trying to take myself as a serious agency, but I'm still a one woman show. Um, but some of the cool projects I did in my first year, 2014, was, by the way, I graduated in 2013 from the University of Victoria <laughs> <laughs> with a degree in international relations and political science. Um, very very disjointed from anything I do today. However, it did help me because Global Access, which was a company I did some voiceovers for through a contact, Jody Martins, um, needed a researcher for a documentary on the Gauteng legislature. But they didn't have enough budget to afford like the real researchers from a university or whatever. So they were like, I said, can you help out with this thing? Sorry, we only had 90,000, but it's like three months work. And I was like, you are cool, 90,000. So that all the time. <laughs> but I was going in every single day and they wanted to pay me weekly and I said no no no, it's pay me at the end because if I if you pay me every week I'm not gonna see what the, the value of that money I'll spend it and it just won't make sense. So pay me at the end. So for three months essentially I was working for free. I wasn't paying anything, I was spending all my money, thank God, on the car train because the car train came into our lives and I was like, yeah, they made this thing for me. And um, I spent money on transport, spent money on food, but when that 19,000 rand came in, I was able to deposit all of that into my newly open bank account and open to more communications. All of this was happening whilst I was living at home. I didn't have a car, um, I wasn't paying rent. Um, I, I, we live in a two bedroom townhouse, so I was sleeping on the couch every night, and it was fine for me because I didn't have any expenses beyond my transport and my cell phone. So that 90k became my capital to be able to afford to work with the big corporate giants because when my first job came in with MTV, they their vendor loading process took a while. So it took like 30 days to load me as a vendor and then another 30 days to get paid. But in that in that 60 days the work needs to get done. And the work that has to get done is printing off flyers. We need to pay this to the army so that they don't Tweet about you not paying them, not trading for all the wrong reasons. Um, I had to pay for street sheets, pay for transport, pay for things to happen. And I think that's where a lot of the small business failures are. A lot of small business gets the work but can't afford to do the work. 
And that's where we get this conversation about capital, the capital, the capitalization, and all our struggle with capital and funding. And it's it's not to not to be naive about it or to make it light, like make light of people's situations or downplay how serious capital is. But I did what I could physically do myself and earn a lot of money so I could capitalize my own business. I don't owe anyone any money. Probably now because overdraft because they were issues up now. But um, <laughs> um, for a very long time I was scared of overdraft. For a very long time I didn't take out a loan. For a very long time I didn't borrow any money from anybody. And there are very few people that I owe money to. It's only my thing. Now I owe those guys in my website for point. Hey guys. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure they're in I say it's not that. Because they're also taking time to invest. They don't need the money. But I've got salaries to pay. I've got um, stipends to pay for all the like service, I mean, service providers. The point is, I worked with what I could to make money to sustain the business and run it. So Jean Dimitri moves to me. I work at MTV now, or I'm, I've got MTV as a client to do this kind of stuff. Then he says, don't you want to pitch for the mamas? The mamas are coming up and we need a marketing team, we need some really fresh ideas. Um, this is the scope of work. So he says, the scope of work, he says, do you do out of home? I'm like, no, I don't, but I know some people who do. He says, do you do above the line stuff? I don't know, I don't, but I know some people who do. So I put together this team in the office that I was working in for free. Plus, out of home, you've got experience with that? Yeah. Um, and then I'll handle the social media, but at the time I had just met Shara Sasuki, who I on Twitter asked if I could work for. And he said, I don't have a job for you, and I said, You need a PA, and he said, I actually do. So then I started working for him. I said, I'm not too ladies. You need a PA. <laughs> the PA, the PA <laughs> word really gets you him, actually. Um, and I charged him 5k a month, and I saw him three days a week. But in seeing him, I was basically running his life. Anything from arranging a car service to paying the rent, well, making sure that the office rent is paid, making sure employees are in the office, all of that kind of stuff. So I didn't have any experience being a PA, but I had experience being organized and just making sure that you, you do what you said you would do. So he had just started Plum Factory, which was a social media agency, and I said, okay, cool, we've got this. They were doing the Twitter Army thing at a much bigger scale than I was. Because he was a toilet and he understood it, and he had all his toilet friends, and Kaya Zana, and a whole bunch of cool people. Um, so I brought this mama's thing to the table. And then Lance was for out of home, so we pitched. And we got the work to do the social media aspect of it with an army in Nigeria, an army in Kenya, and an army in South Africa. We did a campaign where we traded 56 days every single day with a different hashtag. It was unseen in South Africa. No one had ever like thought to do that. I don't know why. But it was a 350,000 rand campaign. Um, my commission was 35k, but I worked every single day of those 56 days of hashtag training. So I was at MTV every day going in to talk to the digital people at MTV just to make sure that they are doing what we need them to do because we couldn't rely on them sitting in the offices. Then the one day, the marketing assistant quit. Like, immediate resignation, because she found a new job. Quit! She quit. So Jean is like, dude, um, she's quit, now we're short start, and it's the mama's now, it's July, building up to go to Durban. And um, Jean was like, don't you want to come work yet? As a joke. And I was like, well, okay, cool, let's see. So he spoke to the head of China, Dylan Khan. And I was like, yeah, okay, that actually makes sense. Let's put it off on the table. So HR contacts me and I say, well, my company is paying me 18,000 rand a month. You're going to need to top that. Otherwise, I'm not stopping what I'm doing because I'm going to be locked out to you guys every single day. And they're like, okay, cool. We'll match you, your 18K. And then I said, okay, but you've also got to put the EMAs on the table. I want to be able to go and work at the EMAs. I'll pay for myself, but I need to go. Um, so, so just to break it down, the models were the um, MTV Africa Music Awards. MTV Awards. EMAs were the European Euro Music Awards. Music Awards also for MTV, right? Also MTV. Okay. So how I knew about the EMAs? Back to dancing. Jay and I pitched to do the choreography for the models because Somizi was doing them for like some all ten, all ten years. But Somizi and he was great at it, but we were just like, hey, let's put our hands up and see if we can, you know, 
try ourselves out because we've got all these hip hop dancers, we just yeah. we were doing the Kendrick Lamar tour, that was cool. So on Kendrick Lamar made the reason I think Kuli that made to me, um, made her feel it on the dream team. Um, and they were just seeing this young girl that's really active, energetic, and organized, and so busy, because it's a young pop. So, um, worked on the choreography side of things, which maybe we were working on the creative side of things, which now introduced us to the production company, which is BWV. BWV is this huge production company that does about the World Cup opening ceremony, World Cup closing ceremony. They do the Samas, which we're working on right now. They've had the Samas contract for the past two years. They missed the year before because it was Blue Moon Productions. But they, the point is they've done a lot of work. Um, when you talk VWV, you talk about Marge, you talk... Um, what other company? I mean, you don't talk others, it's just VWV. Mm. It's K21. Do my name too. So do my services, all these different production companies, because I've always said I don't want to be what they are but I want to service them because then my market is bigger. Now I'm not going for VWV's check because I don't have VWV's resources, but VWV will have a need for me in whatever I do. So, um, yeah, big projects. Tip Drift Golden Beats that kind of laid the land of MTV. Mamas, and then I ended up working for MTV. Now I'm there for six months. My contract was a six month contract. In that six months, the Twitter army thing blew their minds because we trended for 56 days, one billion impressions, no one had ever seen that. On the night of the Mamas, we were trending all over the world. Um, and in reporting, now I'm presenting now, I've been given a chance because I'm the brand coordinator, which is basically like a brand manager for MTV and MTV based, but the junior. And they were like, dude, this is your work, so we present it. So we're doing the after report, the post campaign uh, report, sorry to the whole company, and I think that's where people started to take notice of me in the Viacom stable. So now Alex Okosi, that's my name, uh, Tim Horwood, who's a genius, that's my name, Dylan Khan, super genius, he knows my name, and I went on to win an award for most innovative. And the person who had won it before me for nine years before that was Tim Horwood, who was head channel for MTV Base, basically started MTV Base in South Africa. So those kind of things, and just being available to people, helping, being energetic, creative, pop up, inquisitive, got me into some really cool boardrooms. I ended up working on the Comedy Central Festival. I ended up working on the BET Experience in that year. I remember one day, the Thursday before the BET Experience, Chris Horline, who was the marketing, head of marketing the friends, he was just like, dude, I need to make sure people are at the dome before 12 o'clock on Saturday. Like, but it's definitely Thursday. How are we going to activate this? <laughs> like, I don't care, fix it. Make it happen. Fix it. And it happened. We put together a strategy on the Friday. I brought in some people to the office. I was like, Chris, if this must happen, this is how we're going to do it. And he trusted me. And we did it. But that's because he just saw that the, this girl, if she has the will, she'll make a way. And that's kind of how we've gotten through this business journey. I've done a lot of small things and to a great extent for a little bit of money, but now I'm able to say I can invoice relatively well because I've got a lot of experience to back up what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah, that just that was quite impressive. That I don't know. And for me, I don't know if everyone else picked that up, the gems as to <laughs> but uh, yeah. So here we are, we take us to the transition. Now, yeah, you still sort of, you know, employee, but no, we are not you thing. I'm going in now um, myself. Do my connecting. Take us through how you then transition from, you know, semi in to, okay, let me just break free fully I'm in it. So, the thing about not paying rent um, <laughs> spoiled me quite a bit because I didn't have any responsibilities besides like my hair. Also with my hair design, I was like, oh, let me cut it so I don't have to spend thousands of rents or weeks. Um, also because at the time I couldn't afford really good ones, so um, I was getting my nails done, I bought someone that likes clothes. It took me a very long time to buy it because Jay couldn't go at the time. So now I'm negotiating with Icon because the CAF awards are, it's just like, complicated. And I was like, guys, I really have to go. And by the grace of God, they allowed me to go. And being there again, it's a VWV production. Now I'm meeting an 
I'm working with Flavor. I'm working with Devanche. I'm working like all these artists who I worked with on the Marvelous, but now they see me for a second time. So they're like, okay, this chick, she's still here. She's here. <laughs> she's here. <laughs> and it's on a different job. Elaine Smith Black Mombasa was on with us. The Muffins are with us on that trip. And those relationships that we established sitting in the airport waiting for four hours in the was or we're all like criticizing the food, or the beds are really hard, we just find things to talk about over that week that we're there together. I managed the muffins today through that relationship. Um, and a lot of the dancers that we used on Glow are working on the side, so they're in rehearsal on that. Yeah. Again, small things that didn't pay me a lot of money, but I made the effort to be there because that experience I wouldn't have gotten being in the office at MTV on that day or that week. So now it's February, and my philosophy at the time was get someone else to pay for your expenses whilst you chase your dreams. Okay? So I always had a job because it sustained my life, but all the other things I was able to do for free because I had a job paying my salary. Quick question. How, how? Because I mean, some people here have a job as well. I mean, you're trying to do something on the side. How did you manage to, to, to handle the two and still manage to do great in both mm -hmm. with only 24 hours? So, you know, Beyonce and us, we have the same 24 hours, man. And as much as she may have a bigger team, she doesn't have a different brain to the rest of us. She doesn't have different looks to the rest of us. She gets tired like we do. but I think we let our minds get the better of us. Say, no, I'm tired, so I'm going to sleep. Or no, I'm hungry, so I must eat. Or it's late, so I must go. Um, we have an excuse for every problem. Or we, yeah, we have a problem for every solution. And I think I've always just been, okay, work harder. No one cares. No one cares that you had a nine to five job, but you said you would send me the proposal by two o'clock or whatever. So with managing my time, um, I use a lot of freelancers, other suppliers. I put a lot of people on because I also don't believe in keeping everything to yourself. So you can work with a lot of people and the job is still yours. The client still knows you, but give people a chance. So I did a lot of that and that's kind of how I was able to make a lot of things happen at the same time. I like that. So before I hand out to the audience, Quick questions so that we can wrap up. Um, we now fully into Bujum, right? Business is running and we leave MTV. So, as you tell us a quick story as to how you transitioned to Juma Collective, um, I want you to maybe highlight some of the biggest challenges you've had in the business and yeah, in the current projects that you need to be working on now because you mentioned that you busy with the Sardis now going to Sun City like this week. So just just to wrap up that, yeah. So leaving MTV, I maintained my relationship with Plum Factory, which was Shaka's company. And um, he was like, yo dude, I need an ops person. The company's growing and I'm too busy to run it. So I was like, cool, put me on coach. So when I left MTV, it was with a plan to go and work for Plum. And the conversation was like, I still need to be able to do all my freelance and stuff, work on events do choreography, whatever I need to do. So, went to Plum Factory and moved it from Brown to Sandton, just put in some you know, structures, some policies, yeah, some processes, not policies. Um, employ some people, you know, fix things a bit, and that's how we were able to grow so quickly, because it was just small things that we were missing. The talent was there, it was just organizing the talent into a functional machine. So I did that, and then came October, the first weekend, um, I think I had delicious face. No, first weekend was fill up the dough. The second weekend was delicious. The third weekend was actually was fill up colado, then delicious, then homecoming, and then there was a fourth event I forgot now. But I was off work for that whole month, and I just said that it actually doesn't make sense that I'm putting in twenty percent of my time into my business but I've generated over a million rand. What would happen if I were to go 100% full steam? So I took a leap of faith and left Plum, and a lot of my energy was spent on building the company. I had one employee at the time who was a freelancer, and she went everywhere with me, and um, I ended up employing a second person, and then a third, and then a fourth, and then a fifth, and now there's eight of us, 
and um, since October 2016 till now, I've gone from a small enterprise to a small to medium enterprise to a medium enterprise now. In walks to a collective and a need to have a company that can invoice without being bad registered because a lot of the promoters that we work with are not bad registered and they can't charge their van because they cry, we're really giving it discounts, our artist fees, ah ah ah. So it just makes sense to have a second company that can handle that and make Uber and I'll deal primarily with the FMCGs. So all the vendor stuff, having a net certificate, a tax certificate, I pay my badge on time, I pay my PAYE on time, I pay my income tax on time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also I'm able to recoup a lot of the money that we spend on bad registered companies and suppliers. So that's really the reason I have a Giva Collective. But it also came from conversations I've had with other people across the continent and people I'd like to work with. And this mood to money was very difficult. And I couldn't I couldn't like be arrogant about the realities for too long. I had to come up with something that can be a brand that I can build and people can easily recognize it. So Duma Collective is a derivative of Duma and it still means something on its own. It's a real Duma. So I'm here with the raw, you know, there's a story behind that name and it's not too far from my ancestors and the reason I think a lot of things have gone so right for me. Because it doesn't make sense why I've had so many opportunities the way that I've gotten them beyond the fact that I've worked really hard for them, for them, and there's a higher power that is moving in my favor. So yeah. So that could have made you either go look for a job or you know what I mean? Like that could have troubled you within that time. How did you deal with that? Um, to be very honest, I've been very privileged, very lucky um, that I've had enough discernment to be able to make the right choices when it comes to how I conduct business. I've never boxed about my weight, I don't hire too quickly, I don't take on too many financial responsibilities too quickly, so financially I can't say that there's been a hospital, because a lot of people have those stories. I didn't buy a fashion car. Um, I've recently just qualified for a bond, and by God's grace, I've qualified 100%, so I'm not going to take money and say, oh, there's money, so I'm going to pay a 500,000 deposit. No, the bank is giving me a bond, and I'm taking the 100% bond because I want to be able to manage my cash flow. So I've been, I've been lucky enough to have that kind of discernment. The biggest maybe disappointments along the journey is when I don't deliver to a client's expectation. While that really like crumbles me because at the end of the day, everything I have today is because of the clients that make sure that we get paid. Um, when a client is disappointed or dissatisfied or they just have a reason to not be happy, it really like devastates me. And it doesn't matter what the reasons are. It can be that other suppliers didn't do things. It can be that people just decided to turn on you. It can be people malicious, being malicious. Or, you know, at the end of the day, there's nothing that is excused. There's, there's no excuse in the world that is good enough for a client that is dissatisfied. So I put my back into making sure that clients are happy. I deliver beyond the call of duty. And sometimes it is to our detriment because our competitor agencies that have been there for longer than us because they've enjoyed more privilege than we have don't do as much. And when they see someone else coming for their cheese, even though you're not coming for their cheese, they'll do a lot to be or put themselves or position themselves as people that are not there to help you. So I think maybe the hardest thing was realizing that not everyone is in your corner, or not everyone is there to help you, or not everyone wants to see you succeed. And that you just have to work ten times harder to get half of what they get as I remember that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alright, hearing the story like this, and I'm sure there's so much more we can get into, but we only have one night unfortunately. Um, so I want to open it up to a couple of questions. I think we're gonna take maximum five questions if people have any. Um, hi guys, my name is Sakina Morini. I'm the director for the startup Grind Bell Triangle. Um, thank you very much for that interview, it was really amazing. Um, but one thing I think I picked up from so much that you've said is your involvement in the business. 
I just feel that it's just too much. And how do you duplicate them or replicate yourself in this instance? Because there is that phenomenon that somehow a company should be able to operate without you. Would you be able to go on holiday somewhere on an island with no network and your company would still function? So the truth of the matter is I've been very precious about me being the one to do the work because a lot of people, a lot of our clients have invested in the business because of me or have given the work because they want me to work on it. And I'm going through the journey now where I'm conscientizing my clients to say, guys, I'm not a freelancer. That freelancing operation you were laughing about, I'm trying to corporatize the business into an agency that can compete with the other agencies that exist, and I need you to give me a chance to do that. So, I've, with my team, I have someone that comes into every meeting with me, um, and across the different business units. So on a social media level, we've got one Ellen. On an artist level, we've got Sarah. Ellen runs across the board from events, she does social media, she does artist stuff, but the point is to have my clients get to know other people in the business so that they can start trusting them. So I am taking my first holiday for the first time in three years next week. And, <laughs> and it's the first time I need to go on leave, but also I think I've proved to my clients enough that even when they are on leave, I'm working for them. So they just need to give me a chance to recoup. I've had to say to some of the artists, and I mean, that's disappointing to a certain extent, but I've had to say to them, guys, I need a break. I need to go and just reboot. Otherwise, I'm going to crumble. One time I worked, I think it was like, if I count correctly, 28 hours straight on an event I was at the Derby of July. I left the site at 5 a.m. to go and shower at the guest house. Driving back to site, I crashed the car, rode it off because I was genuinely so tired. I thought I saw a cat. There was no cat, but I thought I saw one. And I crashed into a tree, rode the car off, went into the ambulance, got to hospital, did the x-rays, went back to site, because that's who I am. My clients needed me to work, and I was there, fresh from hospital, on site, working a full day. And this was just two years ago. I still haven't taken all holiday since then, so I had to be very hard on myself to say, dude, I will continue with it without you. At the end of the day, when we did, these people will find another agency to work with. So look after yourself, but teach people. Teach people how to do the job, otherwise, what's the point of paying them a salary every month? So I'm very hard on my team. They work so hard. We, on Saturday, were doing this hiding job. They thought they were there to enjoy. I, we were seeing fires. I said in the group, guys, I need you to be happy you're here to wake up. They're like, no, but our friends are saying your friends <laughs> are not in this company, you're coming to work. And they had to work. But they understand that it's not a charity organization that we're running. At the end of the day, I've worked tirelessly for this company and I expect the same of them, but within reason and by giving them days off, by giving them time to you know relax and take it, and I think I need to do the same for myself. So I'm expanding myself by teaching other people to do what I do. Um, I have three questions. No? Um, hope that's okay. And let me say five for them, then ask the three. That's only one person. But anyway, I just wanted to ask you um, in our journeys, like um, as uh, entrepreneurs or people that want to become entrepreneurs, I think we have a lot of moments when you either question yourself, especially when a lot of doors are shut in your face. You question yourself, you question whether or not what you want to do is worth it, whether it's going to be a success. And you have moments then when you want to give up. And it sounds like you didn't have very many of those moments. But what would you say to someone who is currently watching this and you know, is deciding to give up and thinks, ah, it's actually not really worth it? Um, it's, it's whatever decision you make, live with it. So if you decide to give up, Make sure you've decided to give up and you understand that there's no one you can blame for that decision. Don't say, no, the industry's too hard, no, the environment doesn't serve young entrepreneurs, small businesses, ha, ha, ha. We make all these excuses because we've decided to give up. There are so many people that could have given up but didn't and then they hit their break. So 
when you decide to give up, you must be able to live with the disappointment in yourself. Don't resent yourself, don't resent anyone else. Because there's nothing, I can't say, oh, keep going. Porsche. <laughs> Because there are some people who give up genuinely and then they find something else to do and then that works out for them. So whatever the consequences of giving up are, imagine it and know that you can accept living with those with that decision to give up. Everything starts with the decision because every action has a reaction. So if you decide to give up, whatever comes with that, be ready to accept it. That's the only thing I can say because the general sentiment is that when you give up, it's negative. So then maybe you'll be encouraged to not give up because you don't want to have to deal with resenting yourself. It's really that simple. It's just like giving up on a diet, giving up on the gym. You were dieting for two weeks, you didn't lose anything, you're like, oh, I'm screwed, I need a Big Mac. Now you feel terrible because you ate that, gave that Big Mac because you gave up. Even those consequences. Thank you. Very nice. Um, another question I had was, what do you think people value in you and your business? And what makes what do you think makes them want to work with you? Like, what do you think sets you apart from other agencies? I think it's twofold. Um, for people who need access or need something from the network I have, it is that that I have or the perception that I have access to people and a network and. To a certain extent, it attracts some really cool people that fit into my ecosystem. So I'll have answers and say, yo, I want to work with you because you're great. And I'm like, mm -mm, you want to work with me because you have access to this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. It works for me, and sometimes it works for them. So that's on the one end. With clients specifically, people who are in control of budgets or in control of campaigns or whatever, I think for them it's the fact that they've seen me work so hard for other people. I'm very precious about protecting people's careers. I'm very precious about making sure that people have a way to grow and something to brag about. As much as it's cool for me to brag and say, yo, I was part of this team that did this, that, and the other, I have people who have people they report to, and they must be able to go to their bosses and say, yo, this is what we do. And that helps them grow in their journeys. And when they grow, they take you with them. Jean being an example, Jean moved from Miller to MTV. He moved with me. And he's now moved on to MTN. And there was a, an opportunity for me to do some stuff there, it just didn't work out. But because he saw how much I put my back into making sure I don't disappoint him, and I don't disappoint the team, I don't disappoint people that work with him, he was able to take me along. And that's been the value of it's happened with Dimakato, it's happened with Wivel, it's happened with a lot of people I've worked with in the past. I'm still working with today because of how hard I go for them and how hard we go for them as a company. So now they know Ellen will run because Sibu would run. And they've seen me coach them into doing that kind of thing and that kind of client service. I don't think you'll find in a lot of other agencies. People can call me at 11 o'clock and say, bruh, I need you to come swipe for this thing at 10 o'clock or a go. It's fine, I'll come swipe for you at 10 o'clock go and we'll build it as something else tomorrow. But I don't think twice about going within reason, but I don't think twice about doing something for a client that will make sure that the success of the campaign is ensured. Thank you. So I think hard question is really important. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, last question. We were actually having a discussion about this the other day, but I just want to, you know, get your opinion on it. Um, in the beginning of the interview, you said that you know you you're not from a privileged background. You know you you weren't born with a civil school in your mouth, but you had a lot of motivation from your mom and your sister, and you know they were the example for you. So that also pushed you, I think, to be able to get you where you are. So you were really motivated by them. Um, so we were having a discussion the other day, you know, talking about young girls and boys in the township that um, you know aren't from privileged backgrounds as well, but they aren't aware of the, the potentials in society and you know they don't have the realistic examples among them to see um, successful people and what they're doing or how they got to where they are. And for me, the argument was, but I feel like if you want to know something and you want to get somewhere in life, 
you need to become that person to uh, be informed. And other people were completely against it because they're like, no, if you don't have an example in front of you, if you don't see someone from your hood or township um, uh, coming from a certain background and coming back to the hood and saying, I made it to this spot because of X, Y, Z, and they have their own story to tell. It's difficult for those young boys and girls to have a vision and, and see themselves, you know, um, somewhere in life. So, what's your take on that, and do you think that that can change, and how? Um, I think it's a very difficult uh, situation to solve because I do attribute a lot of my being to my exposure. Um, for, like for example, my dad is, I haven't mentioned him much, but he's a very big influence on my life. And he didn't finish the trick, he had to go to work, and his story, exile, ha, 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 ha. But he came back, and he started a company, um, and did really well, and then lost everything, and then built himself up again. So that the exposure to that, um, counted for something. The exposure to a mother who's doing it for herself, um, hasn't relied on a man ever, that counted for something. The exposure to my sister, who's been doing it for herself as well, didn't rely on anybody for anything, that counted. My teachers, I went to two government schools and a private school. All of that exposed me to different people, the TV shows I was watching, the books I was reading. So I do think exposure counts a great deal because those kids in Oshini, if they don't get enough of that kind of reminder, you don't know, it's only one of the teachers that they're seeing, maybe who members who are under 78, and we are said that you A, B, C, ha, 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 every day they see that. That's what they're exposed to when they come home, their parents come from whatever jobs that they come from, that's what they're exposed to every day. So if we, who have the benefit of exposure, don't go out and be the replacement for that, then it will change. So I do believe very strongly that whilst maybe you grew up in a very terrible background, what you're exposed to at the school you go to, whether it's a government school or whatever, the teachers that you might be privileged to have, other community leaders, if you go to church, that's exposure. So we just need to provide an environment as people who can of exposing people to different types of inspirations. Whether that's just telling a kid, okay, we have a past school you stay once a week. It doesn't cost you anything to do that, but it provides some kind of exposure. It doesn't always have to be, I'm a success story, I made it up a hood. Uh -uh. It can just be a conversation. Exposing them to the clothes you wear. Oh, it's now better. This, I own this for three years, and then, oh, okay, I can just cycle my gene and make it this, that. That's exposure. So, we, that's the part we can play because we can't accept that. No, people can go and learn if they want to. They don't know they can go and learn if they want to, if they haven't been exposed to someone saying that to them. So a lot of that counts, I think. Man, I really feel like we have the church right now, you know? Yes, <laughs> no, but it's true. Look, I think sometimes the truth is out there, but we don't live it. Yeah. And for me, that, that's that's... The beauty of this event for me is that you get to speak to people who might be living it a little bit more than you are in some respects, and maybe you living it a little bit more in other respects. But it's 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 all about growth, and I think personally, I feel like tonight there's so many key things that I've taken from 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 our chat and and, and the questions that I can immediately actually start executing with them. But before we do all of that. Before we close up, because we yeah, are time is, you know how many times she goes, she will get it. She's not, she's not with us. Fortunately, we won't be taking any other questions, except this last one from yours truly. I feel like there's so much we didn't even touch on, <laughs> which is crazy. But I mean, it's, yeah, the time. Unfortunately, it is what it is. What is your vision for Juma Collective and Juma Communications? And for example, and I know it's cliche, you know, like, but you see yourself in five years, and you see in ten years, but it's, it's less than that. For me, it's more like if you now 
50s, 60s, you chilling, you know, grandkids running around. What is the story you want to tell about your company and, 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 and what legacies do you want to leave behind? So firstly, um, I didn't get to where I am by having a business plan. I didn't get to where I am by having a roadmap, by having a plan. I honestly just did it every day and did it very passionately every day. So to say in five years time, I see myself having a Dallow media size company or listed on the JSE or would be a lie because I don't know where I see myself in five years time. What I do know is I want to continue to create opportunities for people to do what they love every single day. I want to continue to create opportunities for black people in corporate to shine because their service providers are so great. I want to continue to be a good story to tell. I want to continue to be an example of a black female that is doing really well. Not just well, but really well and doing really well doing something that they love and is changing other people's lives in the process. So I got in here by taking it one step at a time, one day at a time, and I'm going to continue to do that until we get to a place where we're talking about, oh damn, see one better, we need to book her, who do we talk to, because you can't exist, me, that's the guy <laughs> DMing me, you've got to talk to my team, and there's like 40 people employed just to deal with you having to book me. If I could get to that level, that means that I've done I, well, I've contributed enough to society that my opinion is valued enough for people to go through that trouble to try to get me to speak at an event. So, yeah, five years time, I see myself doing exactly what I'm doing, just at a bigger scale and with a lot more people whose salaries I have to release every month and someone will be doing it in my mouth because it's a lot of work. Um, and paying more taxes. <laughs> my employees all having cars and having bonds and having families that they can feed and people's lives being changed. That's where I see myself in five years. I think that actually answers the biggest question because, um, yeah, you, you're all about changing people's lives. And I, think, I think all of us felt it tonight and the impact that you have and your, your, your genuineness is, it's palpable, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's literally, it's beautiful to be old for for and One very practical tip. All right. This one very, very practical thing, and I don't think enough black people speak about this. When you see money come into your account, don't spend it on things you want. Spend it on the things you need until you can afford to not worry about spending on the things you want. It's okay to drive a car that's cheaper than the next. As long as it gets from A to B safely and allows you to do your job to make more money, in five years time you'll be able to drive the car you really want. If you're renting somewhere further that makes you sit in traffic for 40 minutes longer than you would if you stayed inside Sandton City, that's fine because in five years time, girl, you'll be in Stain City. So don't spent just because the money is in your account. Save for a rainy day. Business is not guaranteed. No one owes you anything. No no government owes you anything. No client owes you anything. Even a contract doesn't mean anything these days. So just be careful of that because as blacks we don't talk enough about cash flow. We don't talk enough about financial management. We don't talk enough about saving for a rainy day. We complain. We complain instead. And then we think nothing. To the credit of a lot of people who have had the story about, oh, I lost everything and I made it back, great for them, that might not be all of our stories. So just don't put yourself in a position where you're going to lose everything and you'll be able to make it up and then be able to speak on how you lost everything and made it all back. Take everything away, remember that. That's it. <laughs>